section ninety nine of the inheritance by susan edmundston ferrier this librivox recording is in the public domain volume three chapter twenty eight he whose mind is virtuous is alone of noble kind though poor in fortune of celestial race and he commits the crime who calls him base dryden but it was with difficulty gertrude could be brought to repeat to lindsay all that she had already recapitulated to delmore she had been under an excitement of mind to which every thing had given way she had felt as though she were then about to cast the die for life or death and in the energy of desperation she had told all with the eloquence of feelings which mocked control but here there was no such stimulus and she shrank from repeating the hateful and ignominious detail of her disgrace it was throwing herself too much upon the sympathy and the commiseration of one on whom she had no claim one whom in the heyday of her prosperity she had treated with coldness and ingratitude and she leant her burning brow on her head and strove to steel herself against the kind and affectionate entreaties lindsay used to gain her confidence at length he gathered from her such particulars as enabled him to trace out the whole of the dark transaction which had involved her in ruin for a time his emotion kept him silent while gertrude sat with her elbows resting on a table and her face buried in her hands but lindsay was ever more intent on allaying the afflictions of others than in indulging his own feelings and he soon mastered his own agitation that he might be the better able to calm gertrude's but his voice faltered as he spoke dearest gertrude said he i know it will be in vain to talk of comfort to you in the first anguish of your mind but ah gertrude could you discern the hand that has thus smitten you could you look up to heaven and say it is my father's will i do cried gertrude in a low suffocating voice but alas the feeling burnt feebly in her breast and anything but this i could have borne but disgrace infamy her emotion choked her utterance no gertrude you are unjust to yourself unmindful of god if you attach such ideas of personal degradation to what has befallen you tis true you have no longer a title a vain empty title or wealth to spend perhaps to satiety but how much nobler a being are you now thus dignified by voluntary self-abasement and rich in all the native gifts of your creator than ever you were or would have been as the mere favoured child of this world ah gertrude dear gertrude could you but view yourself with my eyes to have been an impostor an usurper exclaimed she how perverse sorrow has made you gertrude you are neither you have been the victim of imposture but your own name is pure and spotless it is more to those who can appreciate virtue it will carry a nobler sound along with it than any that heraldry could have bestowed how poor is the boast of ancestry compared with that lofty sense of honour which has made you trample under foot all those allurements to which your soul still cleaves even in renouncing this is greatness who but you will judge me thus all who love virtue all who love you gertrude love me repeated she relapsing into an agony of grief oh who could love me base vile abject as i am gertrude cried lindsay in emotion almost equal to her own do you indeed ask who could love you but gertrude was silent for her thoughts were all of delmore lindsay's agitation increased you ask me who could love you gertrude he who has once loved you truly will love you still 
will love you more than ever i he stopped then took two or three turns about the room in great disorder while gertrude absorbed in grief and thinking only of his words as applied to her lover was little aware of what was passing in lindsay's generous heart in a few minutes he regained his usual calmness and approaching her took her hand and said gertrude you are unable to stand this storm which has come upon you you must retire to your own apartment and allow me to act for you i promise you that nothing shall provoke me to violence i promise you that i will bear everything oh you have borne too much already for me cried gertrude with a burst of weeping my best my only friend added she in a voice choked with emotion you will then look upon me as your friend as your guardian as your brother will you not gertrude such and all will i be to you so help me god gertrude could not speak but she pressed the hand which still held hers in grateful acknowledgment and relying on lindsay's promise as she knew she well might she at last consented that he should see her father alone and that she should await the result of the conference after seeing her mind somewhat strengthened and her spirits more composed lindsay then repaired to the library where he found lewiston vainly attempting to hide his rage by affecting to busy himself in coolly turning over the books while it was evident he was only exercising his fury upon them he took no notice of lindsay's entrance but went on tossing over the leaves of a splendid folio in a manner enough to have made a bibliopolist faint then began to whistle with an air of unconcern which however did not sit very easily upon him lindsay waited a few minutes in silence then said i have been hearing a strange tale sir from one have you so sir rudely interrupted lewiston looking at an engraving in the book as if deeply interested in it have you so and what then then i would have your account sir of the same story you would then i must trouble you sir to let me know what your story is in the first place that we may understand each other sir lindsay repeated what gertrude had communicated to him and added it is therefore in vain to attempt to carry on any farther concealment the truth must be proclaimed but for the sake of one whom hitherto i have only known as a dearly loved relative i would fain have it softened as confound her for an idiot exclaimed lewiston furiously as he hurled the book from him with violence and pushed over an inkstand then kicked back his chair and drove everything aside while he took two or three strides across the room biting his thumb in the manner of one who must have something no matter what on which to wreck his passion lindsay was too judicious to interrupt him disgusting as the spectacle of uncontrolled passion was for gertrude's sake he submitted to it in silence at length lewiston stopped and said abruptly has the fool blabbed to anybody else or are you her only father confessor i cannot tell whether the disclosure has been made known to any one else said lindsay for delmore's name had not been mentioned between them but it can signify little since it must soon be made public well she deserves to suffer for her confounded folly but you seem to have a liking for the girl fool as she is then as if communing with himself she is handsome very handsome i've seen nothing like her she'll make a figure in new jersey she'll go well off there lindsay tried to be calm even at the idea of the beautiful high souled gertrude taken to america to be bartered sold by such a savage and said even if you are the person you give out it does not necessarily follow that this unfortunate lady must be compelled to reside with you why what's to become of her it is unnecessary to discuss that question at present but be assured she possesses friends whose influence and fortune neither of them inconsiderable will be devoted to her service that is to say you would marry her such as she is well as you seem to have a liking for her i'll tell you what if the thing has gone no farther and i don't think it has or t'other spark wouldn't have set off as he did why since you're fond of her i'll give my consent that you should have her upon condition that all's to be kept snug 
she'll come to her senses by and by and be sorry that she's played the fool this way and more than that if you'll agree to settle handsomely upon me i'll engage to go back to my own country which is the best after all and since we don't put up together let us keep on different sides of the atlantic what do you say to that sir i say you are a villain burst from lindsay's lips and i must have the most clear undeniable evidence that you are the person you profess to be before i will give credit to it i do not believe you are the father of gertrude and he fixed his eyes upon him as though he would have searched his very soul the blood rushed to lewiston's face and for some minutes he was silent then recovering himself he said in his usual manner i'm all you'll have for him though sir whether you believe it or not i am jacob ruxton lewiston of perth hamboy new jersey and that you'll find if you'll be so good as to step over the way and inquire that may be but there may have been more jacob ruxton lewiston's than one why haven't i got my wife's letter here taking out a pocket-book and holding it up with triumph haven't i the testimony of the priest who witnessed it and he is still alive too and forthcoming if wanted and who swore to her never to give it into any hand but her husband's and isn't there mrs st clair ready to swear to me when she comes to herself what the plague would you have sir all that is insufficient perhaps you judge by my looks i've wore well i grant you but i'm eight and thirty for all that married at nineteen the more fool nothing you can now say will have the slightest effect in removing my doubts said lindsay faith i care very little about it said lewiston with affected coolness you may keep your doubts and welcome for me that i shall certainly do till i have obtained better evidence than your own i will send a person on whose fidelity and prudence i can perfectly rely to the place from whence you say you came to procure proofs of your identity when he returns with these you may then claim your daughter but not till then i am her guardian and will be answerable for her safety here lewiston burst out in a strain of the coarsest invective and imprecations but lindsay remained calm and resolute and only said in these circumstances you must be aware this can be no residence for you you will do well therefore to prepare to leave it as soon as you can make your arrangements and if the means are wanting i am ready to furnish you with what is necessary he then left the room and hastened to gertrude who was waiting him in an agony of apprehension End of section 99section one hundred of the inheritance by susan edmund stoon farrier this librivox recording is in the public domain volume three chapter twenty nine tout ce c'est tout 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 et la verite perce c'est it was with caution lindsay communicated to gertrude the suspicions which he entertained but to one of her sanguine spirit the slightest surmise was sufficient to kindle hope in her breast it was certain she was no longer countess of rossville but not to be the daughter of this man not to loathe and shudder at him to whom she owed her being even this seemed almost happiness but then as she thought of the difficulty of procuring evidence from so distant a quarter of the world her spirit sunk and she exclaimed but how impossible for me to obtain information and how vague and unsatisfactory must it be trust that to me dear gertrude said lindsay i will send by the first ship a person who will thoroughly investigate into this man's history and on whose testimony you may safely rely i would go myself if that would be more satisfactory to you and if i saw you in a place of safety oh lindsay cried gertrude with a burst of tears which for a moment choked her utterance then passionately exclaimed you protect and save me while he she uttered a sob as though her heart had broke then remained silent blinded as gertrude was by romantic passion she could not but be struck with the contrast between her lover's conduct and that of lindsay and the conviction rushed upon her heart with a bitterness which for a time absorbed every other consideration 
with emotion scarcely less than her own lindsay now inquired whether she had divulged the secret to any one else gertrude struggled for a few moments to regain her composure then said yes to one whom it more nearly concerned than any other and now i wait but to hear from him to make known my disgrace to the whole world how false how worldly are your notions of disgrace dear gertrude said lindsay but i will not stop to combat them now tell me what you wish to have done what are your plans it is colonel delmore's wish that i should remain here until i hear from him said gertrude in a faltering voice be it so then said lindsay with emotion but remember gertrude you have a home if you will deign to accept of it my house is yours to command my aunt mrs lindsay whom you have heard me mention is now in scotland and will reside there with you you would love her if you knew her for she is good and gentle and knows what suffering is for myself i shall possibly go abroad for a while or but in short i can be at no loss so promise that if no no i never will be a pensioner on your bounty cried gertrude in violent agitation i will work beg oh lindsay how you wring my heart and she leaned her head on a table and wept bitterly forgive me dearest gertrude if i have hurt you god knows it was far from my thoughts and now let me recommend to you to retire to your own apartment you will be safe from intrusion and leave everything to me rest assured there shall no violence be used he shall be treated as your father though not recognized as such but ought i not to see him once more and o oh, lindsay if i should have turned my father from the house oh no i cannot suffer him to remain he is nay must be my father he could not have imposed upon her at such a distance of time it is quite possible he might but dear gertrude confide in me i will do nothing harshly but you cannot remain under the same roof it will kill you he shall go to my house he shall be well treated indeed he shall and gertrude calmed by these assurances at length consented to shut herself up in her own apartment and even to refuse to see lewiston if he should attempt it lindsay's next business was to visit mrs st clair in hopes of elucidating something from her but he was shocked at the situation in which he found her and immediately sent off for medical assistance and also to mr and miss black requesting them to come to rossville as soon as possible he had scarcely done all this when lewiston entered the room where he was with a mingled air of confusion and effrontery so sir you're going to raise the country it seems two men on horseback galloping away there as if the deuce were in them what's the meaning of all this i must see my daughter added he abruptly when you have established your claim to that title you shall see her till then i have already told you i act as her guardian and as such i will not consent to your meeting if you had the feelings of a parent you would see the propriety of this feelings exclaimed lewiston by jove my feelings have been prettily treated since i came amongst you may i be flayed if ever i met with such usage feelings by jingo i say my feelings have been confoundedly ill-used and i feel it too and he walked up and down in great discomposure she whom you call your daughter is not unmindful of your feelings said lindsay although by my advice she declines a meeting which could serve no purpose but to agitate and distress her but she is very desirous that you should be treated with consideration that you should have every comfort and indulgence which you may require and i shall therefore make a point of seeing you properly accommodated what does she mean by all this palaver does she mean by comfort and indulgences and so forth a round sum of money if she does i comprehend that give me money and faith i'll soon find comforts and indulgences for myself you must be conscious that as your daughter she can have nothing to bestow said lindsay but i possess the means and when assured that you have told me the truth one way or other for the truth is all i require from you we shall then perhaps be able to come to an agreement lewiston remained thoughtful for a few minutes then said has the goose quacked to any but yourself i want to know colonel delmore has been made acquainted with all the particulars and is gone to consult with his brother now earl of rossville as to what is to be done be assured that their hands you will meet with little indulgence here lewiston broke out into an execration against delmore and against gertrude both of whom he denounced in the bitterest terms then suddenly changing his tone he said it will cost you something i can tell you to send to new jersey that it will a few dollars i can tell you i have already told you i am ready to pay a good price for the knowledge of the truth be it what it may said lindsay what even supposing only supposing you know 
that i were not the girl's father perhaps i should be inclined to pay more for that discovery than for any other said lindsay trying to hide his emotion but i again repeat it is the truth and the truth only i require and that sooner or later i am sure of arriving at a few months will bring me the knowledge of that i tell you it would cost you money and i have told you i am ready to pay it why how much do you reckon upon what lengths are you ready to go eh i am willing to go any lengths to detect fraud and villainy but not to reward it i am perhaps wrong in offering to come to any compromise with you but regard for the peace of one who is suffering from your villainy induces me will you give a thousand pound interrupted lewiston abruptly no i will give more if necessary to discover the truth but i will not reward falsehood in the same measure confound your distinctions will you give five hundred by jingo i won't bate a halfpenny upon condition that you swear solemnly to tell the whole truth said lindsay i will do more for you than i am perhaps justified in doing i will pay your expenses from america and back to it and i will settle an annuity upon you of fifty pounds per annum upon condition that you give up that letter and never set foot in britain again i'd rather have a good round sum at once i want it is in vain to say more on the subject said lindsay if you wish to have an hour to reflect upon it you may but that must be all i shall immediately set about the necessary steps to be taken in this affair and it is likely you will repent having refused my offer when too late he was moving away when lewiston caught his arm well will you put in black and white what you have agreed to give and and then we shall see lindsay immediately took up a pen and wrote his offer lewiston took it looked at it hemmed coloured and became confused at last plucking up effrontery he said well then i am not the girl's father and that's as true as that god made me at this acknowledgment lindsay's heart thrilled with rapture and he could scarcely refrain from flying to gertrude with the joyful tidings lewiston went on but i am of the same blood the only one by the by the remaining and the same name i was her father's cousin and when the old dotard of a priest came to perth amboy and inquired for jacob ruxton lewiston to be sure he found me twas by way of humbug at first that i passed myself off for the man who had been drowned nearly twenty years before but when i found what his business was but that's enough i hate long stories and so as soon as you can let me have this on a proper bit of parchment pointing to the paper lindsay had given him then i'll wish you a good afternoon but how came you to impose yourself so easily upon mrs st clair inquired lindsay anxious for gertrude's sake to ascertain everything she had seen the person you represented she had so but it was near twenty years ago and there was a family likeness it seems besides i had the letter to shut her mouth and since i was master of her secret it signified little to her whether i were the girl's father or not i had got the upper hand of her anyhow having got all the information that was wanted lindsay was now only desirous of being rid of so worthless an inmate and after admonishing him upon the iniquity of his ways he gave him a letter to his agent directing the money to be paid and the bond to be made out for his annuity then only waited to see him fairly out of the house before he communicated to gertrude the happy result End of section one hundred section one hundred and one of the inheritance by susan edmund stoon ferrier this librivox recording is in the public domain volume three chapter thirty plus nous étions jeunes moins nous avions de résignation car dans la jeunesse au tout long s'attend d'un bonheur l'on croit en avoir le droit et l'on se révolte à l'idée de ne pas l'obtenir madame de stahl for a time gertrude felt as though she were again restored to all she had lost in her joy at finding she was not the daughter of the man whom her very soul abhorred and at the moment all other evils seemed light compared to that she had just escaped she could not find words to thank lindsay for his generous interference though that was only known to her in part 
but her looks her tears her broken exclamations spoke more forcibly the feelings of her heart but the first flush of joy over many a bitter thought arose she was still the fallen degraded dependent being without a home without a friend save one he to whom she owed all and delmore but on delmore she would not think she would wait in all the unnatural calmness of patience which knew not resignation till she heard from him and then and her heart heaved in agony as she thought what might then be the result lindsay seemed to guess something of what was passing in her mind for he said with some emotion those who like yourself have been imposed upon in this fraud ought not they also to be undeceived shall i perform that duty for you shall i write he stopped but gertrude knew to whom he alluded and for a moment she wished that delmore were indeed apprised of the discovery which had been made that she was not the daughter of the horrid lewiston but in another instant she rejected the idea no thought she i will not seem to court his notice as heiress of rossville i gloried in avowing my preference for him but as the poor homeless gertrude tis he must now seek me my heart may break but it will not bend i will wait i will be to him all or nothing but she almost gasped as she repeated to lindsay i will wait then after a pause she added with a deep blush but do you what you think right for me and lindsay's generous disinterested spirit guided upon every occasion by that heavenly principle do unto others even as you would that others should do unto you prompted him to write and acquaint delmore with the truth as the daughter of lewiston he was certain he never would have stooped to an alliance with gertrude but whether as she was now situated he would still fulfil his engagement was a doubtful question at any rate it was due to him to be undeceived and though he comprehended and approved of the delicacy which kept gertrude silent he deemed it but the more incumbent on him to declare the truth he therefore wrote a simple and brief statement of what had passed without noticing or alluding to anything else and having dispatched his letter he awaited the answer in an agitation of mind little inferior to gertrude's meanwhile dr bruce and mr and miss black had successively arrived and it was lindsay's painful task to make the two latter acquainted with the guilty transaction which he did in the gentlest and most delicate manner but however desirous he was of sparing their feelings it was impossible to soften the disgraceful fact which fell upon them like a thunderbolt and affected them each according to the difference of their mind and feelings when the first shock had been surmounted it was settled that miss black should remain at rossville for the present in attendance upon mrs st clair whose situation was such as to disarm every hostile feeling even could such have found harbour in her sister's breast but it was in sorrow not in anger that she acknowledged the disgrace which had fallen upon them and lindsay hoped that her soft upbraiding spirit might tend to calm gertrude's wilder grief but gertrude refused to see her do not said she to lindsay with an agitation that shook her whole frame do not ask me to see any one at present never ask me to see the sister of she stopped shuddering but you forgive her gertrude said lindsay gertrude was silent for some moments then exclaimed with a burst of emotion oh it is dreadful to have been thus striving against nature striving to love as my mother she who was my bitterest enemy she has broken bands which god himself had knit my mother and i knew her not as such gentle and uncomplaining 
i treated her as my servant oh may god forgive me but do not ask me to forgive her ah gertrude it was not thus we were taught to pray by him who forgave us but gertrude only wept in bitterness of heart dear gertrude you have been heroic will you not be forgiving do not let me think you find it easier to be great than to be good for you i would do much said gertrude in increasing emotion i would do even this if i could but i cannot do not then do not name her to me cried she passionately while she pressed her hands on her bosom as if to still the tumult of her soul she it is who has made me the lost degraded wretched being that i am and ever must remain and again her tears burst forth how you disappoint me gertrude said lindsay with a sigh i had flattered myself that the same greatness of mind which led you to cast far from you all that you most prized on earth would at the same time have taught you the worthlessness of those mere worldly objects ungrateful that you are which of all the gifts a liberal creator has endowed you with would you exchange for those empty distinctions which one creature bestows upon another would you exchange your beauty for rank your talents for wealth your greatness of mind for extended power for all of them would you exchange your immortal soul ah gertrude what avails it by what name you are called for the few short years of your earthly pilgrimage if to be made fit partakers of immortal life is as i believe it is the sole end of existence all that we are called upon to endure here are but means for that end do not impute your trials then severe as they are to a being such as yourself but look upon them as instruments in the hand of god it may be to bring you unto him even in this world gertrude you may yet live to reap in smiles what has been sown in tears if you will look for happiness where it is only to be found gertrude shook her head and still wept but her tears were softer and her agitation less violent lindsay's was not that indiscreet zeal which would break the bruised reed and quench the smoking flax in his blind misjudging enthusiasm he looked not that the soil should be harrowed and the seed sown and the harvest reaped at one and the same time but he trusted that the influence of divine truth would bring peace to the soul still fainting with agony beneath the load assigned it and that the heart which god had stricken would yet in prostrating itself at the throne of grace and acknowledging him in all his ways rise superior to the changes of this passing world o oh, virtue when this solemn pageantry of earthly grandeur shall be no more when all distinctions but moral and religious shall vanish when this earth shall be dissolved when the moon shall be no more a light by night neither the sun by day thou shalt still survive thy votary's immortal friend thou shalt appear like thy great author in perfect beauty thy lustre undiminished thy glory imperishable end of section one hundred and one section one hundred and two of the inheritance by susan edmonstone farrier this librivox recording is in the public domain volume three chapter thirty one i grant that the stroke which has laid thy hopes low is perhaps the severest that nature can know if hope but deferred may cause sickness of heart how dreadful to see it for ever depart barton gertrude now experienced the agony of suspense in all its intensity restless and unquiet 
she walked about her own apartment or starting at every sound stopped to listen with suspended breath then pressed her throbbing heart as though she could have stilled its tumults by the touch of her hand why do i submit to this why do i endure it inquired she of herself as she bent her burning brow in shame at the tears that had fallen in showers on her lover's picture on which she had been gazing he left me and at what a time no i will not wait to be rejected cast off like something vile i will go if it were to beg and for a moment she formed the desperate resolution of leaving rossville secretly of flying she knew not cared not where she would find some spot on which to lay her aching head till death should close her eyes but then the madness of the scheme struck her she felt she could not mingle with the vulgar throng young distinguished and delicately bred where could she find a shelter lindsay tis true had offered her a home but her spirit already bowed beneath the load of gratitude she owed to him then with that ebb and flow of mind which is ever the effect of powerful excitement returned her faith in delmore yes it was it must be his love for her which had hurried him from her his was not that selfish passion he had said so a thousand times which would plunge the object he loved in all the wretchedness of poverty and she knew that he was poor that he was even in debt that it was impossible he could support her as he would have his wife appear but he had gone to prevail upon his brother to provide for them and he would come oh yes he would come and claim her as his own it was thus gertrude communed with herself her mind either a prey to despair or busied in vain fantastic dreams which even if they were destined to be realized it was idleness to indulge her agitation was not lessened when on the third morning after her lover's departure intelligence arrived of the death of mr delmore gertrude was not so callous to right feeling as not to hear of this event with mingled grief and awe and the moral was too striking not to fall with conviction on her heart with tears she acknowledged the vanity the emptiness of worldly distinction and kneeling prayed for the moment fervently devoutly prayed in all the humiliation of a contrite spirit and an awakened heart lindsay did not omit the opportunity of enforcing the solemn lesson which came to shed its calming influence on her ruffled breast it indeed required no very high sense of religion at such a time to feel the utter insignificance of mere worldly greatness and to acknowledge that its grandeurs are vapours its pleasures illusions its promises falsehoods when he on whom it seemed to have lavished all that it had to bestow was now as if in mockery a thing at thought of which the roused soul swells boundless and sublime but alas these wholesome thoughts were yet strangers in gertrude's heart and the first sudden shock over bright thoughts began to spring up even from the ashes of the dead even in this hour of grief and fears when awful truth unveiled appears some power unknown usurps my breast back to the world my thoughts are led my feet in folly's labyrinth tread and fancy dreams that life is blessed again gertrude's heart bounded as she thought her lover was now earl of rossville able and could she doubt willing to restore her to all she had lost she would have renounced all for him she had stood the test and a thousand ay ten thousand times had he wished that it were in his power to prove to her the disinterestedness of his love in return there was no longer room for uncertainty although he might not choose to involve her in the hardships and privations of poverty yet how would he exult in raising her to the height from which she descended and again gay and vainglorious visions began to swim before those eyes still wet with tears of penitence for former follies 
suspense was now changed into impatience scarcely less supportable as she counted the days and hours which must elapse before she could receive the assurance of her lover's faith but at length the time came when she might hear from him but no letter was there another and another and another day passed on every instant of which was as an age of agony to gertrude's throbbing soul as again it was overwhelmed with a sea of doubts and again the sickness of hope deferred crept like poison through her veins but who can count the beatings of the lonely heart once more she had watched from her window the arrival of the post again she had held her breath to listen for the footstep that was to bring her the letter on which her existence seemed to depend but a long and dreary pause followed at length it was broken by a message from lindsay requesting to see her something is wrong thought she he is dead or she could not finish the sentence even in imagination but pale trembling gasping for breath she repaired to the library where she was told he awaited her her own agitation was too great to permit her to notice lindsay's as he advanced to meet her and would have spoken but the words died on his lips then gertrude looked on him but it was not grief that was depicted in his countenance yet neither was it joy but a strange mingled expression agitated his usually serene features which she in vain strove to construe he took her hand but it was in a manner more respectful and an air more embarrassed than he was wont to testify towards her with whom he had hitherto been on the very footing of a friend you have heard you have heard lindsay cried gertrude but she could say no more i have said lindsay with an emotion he vainly tried to master gertrude dearest gertrude he turned from her for a moment and paced the chamber in disorder while gertrude bereft of all motion stood pale and speechless suddenly he approached her and putting a letter into her hands he held them locked in his while he said in a voice choked with agitation gertrude i cannot now say what i feel but if at this time you can think of me at all think of me as your truest your firmest friend as one who shares your every feeling he then quitted the apartment but gertrude was scarcely conscious he had spoken for a glance of her eye had told her the letter was from delmore it was an opened one and addressed to lindsay with desperate courage she unfolded it she began to read it with a beating heart and a trembling hand but as she went on every nerve and fibre felt as though they were hardening into stone it was as follows dear lindsay the melancholy intelligence of my lamented brother's death would reach you some days ago that together with the heart-rending scene i went through at rossville was almost too much for me and must be my excuse for having so long delayed acknowledging your letter perhaps another motive still more powerful has also influenced me which i know i need not hesitate to avow to you it is the earnest heartfelt desire i have to do every justice to one who though still dearer to me than life and whom it is distraction to me even to think of relinquishing yet at present i fear i may not venture to call mine yet mine i know she is and ever will be in heart as heaven knows how wholly i am hers but circumstances we both are it would be folly madness in short you must be aware of the difficulties with which i have to contend you know and i do not hesitate to acknowledge that i consider birth as the most important of all distinctions and i believe i am not singular in my sentiments upon this subject at least i know my uncle the duke who i venture to sound upon this matter is still more decided in his opinion and as he is now in a very declining state and as much in his own power i own i am unwilling to come to extremities with him at present you are aware that the rossville property considerable as it is did not prove sufficient during the last year to support the dignity of the family and that considerable debts have in consequence been incurred i am far from intending to convey the most distant insinuation against the dear object of my affections for if any blame was imputable it would be perhaps more justly due to me 
but she only lived as her rank demanded and as i should choose my wife to do and i merely mention this to prove to you that i am at present far from independent as my own debts that to yourself amongst others dear lindsay are of some magnitude and both together leaves me little choice as to what in common produce i am called upon to do distressing as it is i consider myself called upon for the present to relinquish those hopes which have so long formed the happiness of my life and which i will still cherish even in spite of fate a time may and i trust will yet come when no such heart-rending alternative will be necessary meanwhile it is my most anxious wish that everything should be done that can possibly contribute to the peace and comfort of my adored gertrude i entreat you will therefore prevail upon her to remain at rossville it is my intention to go abroad for a year or two and it will materially contribute to my tranquillity to know that she is still mistress there and in possession of all those enjoyments which i know she prizes so much i must therefore entreat your good offices to have everything arranged on this point let her choose who she will to reside with her or should she persist in choosing another residence let everything be arranged in the most liberal manner i enclose you an order upon coots that you may draw on my account for whatever is requisite let nothing be wanting that can in any degree tend to embellish an existence which alas from henceforth like my own i fear will be but a painful one dear lindsay to your hands i commit my treasure on your friendship i place the utmost reliance i know her affections are mine wholly mine and i but who that has loved gertrude could ever love another i will endeavour to write to her myself when my nerves have regained some firmness but at present you may judge of the state of my mind from this distracted scrawl write to me i entreat of you dear lindsay tell me how my dearest love bears herself write by return of post tell me all everything and believe me your affectionate rossville p s the law people are taking the necessary steps to have my rights recognized contrive to save my poor gertrude's feelings as much as possible on this occasion end of section one hundred and two section one hundred and three of the inheritance by susan edmundstoun ferrier this librivox recording is in the public domain volume three chapter thirty two go to hath life a blessing yet for me i have no country i have no house a refuge from my ills euripides such was the letter and when gertrude ended it she cast one look of anguish to heaven as she murmured for him oh my god i would have abandoned all thou knowest that i would she could not have found a name for the wretchedness which wrung her heart but yet with a mien outwardly calm save for her burning cheek and quivering lip she passed to the adjoining room where lindsay was waiting with the most intense anxiety the effect which this communication would produce as gertrude returned the letter she merely bent her head to him but he saw that her eyes were tearless and her air was even loftier than it was wont she moved on towards a door at the opposite end of the room which communicated with her own suite of apartments and lindsay made no attempt to detain her but when her hand was upon the lock she turned round and approaching him took his hand and pressed it between hers my dear my only friend said she may god bless you why do you say so now dearest gertrude cried lindsay fearing he knew not what from the unnatural calmness of her manner because because i feel it said gertrude with a sigh as though her heart had broke and i may i too say all i feel for you said lindsay with emotion no why should you feel for me i am well quite well said gertrude with the same sort of wild calmness but i will never forget your kindness to me 
a tear gleamed in her eye as she turned away lindsay made an effort to detain her as he exclaimed speak then tell me what you would have me do to serve you to save you if i can from gertrude gently disengaged herself from him while she said in a firm voice i will not remain here but i have arrangements to make before i go do not seek to detain me where will you go dearest gertrude my house is yours and my aunt i will not go to your house edward said gertrude and her voice began to falter then making an effort to regain her composure she quickly added i know not yet where i shall go i must have time i have arrangements to make but i cannot breathe here and she gasped as she spoke then waving her hand to lindsay she hastily entered her own apartment still gertrude's energy did not forsake her as she set about her preparations but she mistook for fortitude what in reality was only fever of mind and it was under that false excitement that she acted she was alive but to one feeling she had been deserted by him for whom she would have sacrificed the world itself he whom she loved sufficiently even to have renounced he whom every hallowed obligation every principle of honour every feeling of tenderness had bound to her by ties she had considered as indissoluble he had dared to insult her by supposing she would choose to be indebted to his bounty for her support he deemed her unworthy of being his wife and he would have her submit to become his pensioner to live upon his alms to be clothed and fed by him to drag out a life of dependence amid those very scenes which had witnessed her in the full meridian of her prosperity she could not she would not consider what she was to do whither she was to go it mattered not what became of her were she but away from rossville she would work beg starve but she would not sink into a base stipendiary but alas gertrude knew nothing of life and its ways when she reasoned thus she knew nothing of those various manners and degrees in which every human being even those possessed of the loftiest feelings of independence are bound more or less to one another she only panted to escape from the degradation she felt she was enduring and every other idea was absorbed in that single one but when her arrangements were completed then the dreadful sense of her own utter loneliness came upon her and she pressed her throbbing temples in agony as she leant her head upon her hand and vainly strove to think of whither and to whom she would go but the world seemed all before her where to choose for she had no claim upon any one being in it and who would claim her abject degraded fallen as she was no one but the generous noble-minded lindsay and he was the last person she would have recourse to she could not bear that he should look upon her in her humiliation he knew that she had been rejected forsaken he had seen that heart which had been so fondly sought so proudly won now cast back upon her as a thing of naught she was roused from this agony of thought by the entrance of her maid to announce that mr ramsay was in the saloon and wished to see her i will not see him i will not see any one that and again the horror which she felt for all connected with the author of her misery rushed upon her my lady exclaimed miss masham i am not your lady i am but no matter you will know all when i am gone gone where whither repeated she to herself then the sudden resolution seized her that she would see mr ramsay he would take her from rossville no matter what became of her after that and not daring to deliberate she hastily passed on to the apartment still under the excitement of feelings strained to their utmost stretch mr ramsay had been made acquainted by mr black with the discovery which had taken place and for some time indignation against mrs st clair was the only feeling that found place in his breast 
then as that somewhat abated his heart began to yearn with pity towards the victim of her guilt and at length that stranger sentiment for uncle adam was not prone to the indulgence of such weakness gradually grew into something almost akin to joy at the thought that she whom he had always loved for her resemblance to his first and only love was indeed her descendant the resemblance even in his mind's eye grew twenty times stronger and he felt that he should look upon her with greater delight as the granddaughter of lizzie lundy than ever he had done as countess of rossville she was his own nearest relation too for lizzie and he had been cousins german brother and sister's children while his connection with the blacks was only by half-blood all this uncle adam had revolved over and over again as he paced his little chamber irresolute how to act at length unable to come to any fixed determination he took chaise from the blue boar and set off for rossville where he arrived as if heaven directed at the very moment when his appearance seemed indeed as an interposition of providence for the first time he voluntarily extended his hand and grasped gertrude's in it with a vehemence which was indicative of the warmth and sincerity of his good will both were silent for some moments for even uncle adam for the time seemed overcome but at length he said it is needless to say ony thing aboot it i dinna want to hear ony mare just tell me whether i can do you ony good will you gang wi' me oh yes yes cried gertrude take me from this oh take me now but stay now are you sure you're ready said mr ramsay who was not quite so rapid in his movements and who although perfectly sincere in his offer had not expected it to be so promptly acted upon moreover he was not quite sure that they perfectly understood each other and he thought some explanation necessary before they set off together he would fain have put the question in a delicate form but he had never been accustomed to sounding and delicacy was not his fort he was therefore fain to have recourse to his own method of gaining information which was to put the question in the most direct manner and he said with his usual bluntness do you ken war it is your goin the question struck like a dagger to gertrude's heart and smote with the consciousness of her own desolation she could not speak she turned away her head to hide the burning drops that forced their way from her eyes i have no home said she in a voice choking with emotion i am a beggar i'm very glad to hear it said uncle adam warmly that's just the very thing i wanted i rejoice that you're to owe naething to that prudrawn pack so come with me my dotty and ye's no want for ony thing that i hae to gie you lizzie lundy's bairn will be my bairn so come your ways the bird mon flicter that flees wait a wing but ye's harned up your head yet in spite of them all in the tumult of her mind gertrude had entirely overlooked the ties which bound her the daughter of jacob lewiston to him whom she had only known as the uncle of mrs st clair but now it glanced upon her that in uncle adam she beheld a relation of her own the only being with whom she might claim kindred but she was too wretched even to feel pleasure at the discovery she only considered that he would take her away that he would give her a shelter and there she would die and be heard of no more is there naebody here you wad see before you gang said mr ramsay as she was hurrying wildly away no no cried she impatiently then suddenly stopping yes i've one kind friend to whom i will say farewell once more as the thought glanced upon her that lindsay would be glad to see her so protected and she sent to say she wished to see him he instantly hastened to her and was made acquainted with the arrangement which had been made though he was still left in ignorance of the relationship which subsisted between them for gertrude in the fervour of her mind had already ceased to think of it and uncle adam from certain tender feelings was unwilling to enter into particulars 
although he was not exactly the person to whose hands lindsay would have chosen to commit gertrude yet situated as she was even uncle adam's home was better than none especially as he most cordially invited him to come to it as often as he pleased there is one person you wished me to see and i would not said gertrude in agitation to lindsay as she was almost on the threshold to depart but now i would see her sister before i go and the wish was no sooner signified to miss black than she hastened to comply with it at sight of her a slight tremor shook gertrude's frame but she neither wept nor spoke she merely kissed her twice with fervour then turned away and bade a long farewell to rossville the same day mrs st clair was removed to the house of her sisters End of section one hundred and three section one hundred and four of the inheritance by susan edmonstone ferrier this librivox recording is in the public domain volume three chapter thirty three sorrows are well allowed and sweeten nature where they express no more than drops on lilies but when they fall in storms they bruise our hopes make us unable though our comforts meet us to hold our heads up messenger but this state of high-wrought feeling could not long continue in vain gertrude struggled against the burning sense of her wrongs and her wretchedness in vain she repressed each rising sigh and starting tear with lofty scorn at the weakness they would have betrayed in vain she repeated to herself a thousand times that she was calm she was well her throbbing head and aching heart told another tale and she was at length compelled to yield to the fever which for some time had been preying upon her then reason fled and for many days her life was doubtful and during that time poor uncle adam like some faithful mastiff hung round the bed which contained his new-found treasure in all the stern woe of rigid old age lindsay was the only person excepting the medical attendants whom he would see but to him he would utter the grief which filled his heart even to overflowing long closed as it had been against each softer feeling and lindsay even in the midst of his own anguish strove to cheer and support the disconsolate old man but the object of all this solicitude was once more restored to them the crisis of the fever was past and gertrude again awoke to consciousness it was only then she was aware of the danger she had passed she had walked unconsciously through the valley of the shadow of death the gates of eternity had been before her but she had not described them it was then while still hovering on the confines of this world that she felt all the emptiness and the vanity of its pleasures her dreams of greatness her hopes of happiness her gay spent days her festive nights where were they now gone and where they had been was marked but with shame disappointment remorse all earthly distinctions had been hers and what was the account which she had now to render to god for the use of these his gifts on which of these was it that she would now build her hopes of acceptance with him on which of them would she now rest her hopes of eternal happiness alas miserable comforters were they all a deep melancholy now took possession of gertrude's mind like all persons of an ardent and enthusiastic temperament she flew from one extreme to the other and what had formerly whispered as faults now roared as crimes only to be expiated by a life of penitence and sorrow she kept her own apartment refused to see anybody even lindsay and passed her time in solitude and woe in vain did uncle adam attempt to stem the tide of affliction which had thus broken in upon her shattered heart she acknowledged his kindness with tears and with gratitude but when he attempted to remonstrate with her or urged her to see any one she became violently agitated and her only answer was if you love me suffer me oh suffer me to die in peace the indulgence of her grief had now become 
a sort of strange unnatural luxury to her she loved to sit for hours brooding on her sorrows to hoard them as it were in her own heart she could not have borne that another should have shared in them she loved to think that no one could share in them that she stood alone in the world a wretched forsaken lonely thing to a heart such as hers the existence of some powerful sentiment was necessary she had strove to tear from her heart every root every fibre of her once cherished tenderness but no flower had arisen to fill the void they had left all was dreariness and desolation lindsay had written to her repeatedly urging and imploring her to see him and using every argument to rouse her from this wasteful excess of grief but she only wept when she read his letters and wished that he would cease to think of one so wretched so degraded as she was poor uncle adam was almost heartbroken at this pertinacity of suffering all that he possessed he had told her again and again should be hers she should go to bloom park she should be mistress there she should have everything that gold and good will could procure to make her happy but gertrude would only exclaim no no once i had wealth and power and how did i abuse them leave me then the beggar that i am that i deserve to be she was in this state of mind when one day the door of her apartment was gently opened and anne leslie slowly entered at sight of her gertrude turned away her head in displeasure at the intrusion but anne caught her hand and as she respectfully kissed it her tears dropped upon it gertrude stood some moments irresolute then throwing herself on anne's neck she exclaimed with a burst of anguish you trusted in god and he has not deceived you while i she stopped overcome with the acuteness of remembrance but you will trust in him and he will yet put gladness in your heart said anne wiping away the tears from her own sweet serene face where shone the peaceful calm of a heavenly mind no never said gertrude i do not deserve to be happy added she in an accent of despair ah who has ever deserved that happiness which we owe to a saviour's love if thou lord shouldest mark iniquities who shall stand guilty and frail as we all are which of us would dare to lift up our eyes to heaven and say we merited its favour but i had power and i misused it i had wealth and i squandered it i had an idol oh my god and thou wast forgot alas said anne meekly who can weigh even their own actions in the balance if your errors were more glaring than mine so were your temptations greater he only who made the heart can judge it for he only knows what have been its trials he knows said gertrude bitterly that in the day of prosperity mine was far from him and therefore has he dissolved those vain delights which had taken possession of the soul he had destined for himself ah do not look to god merely as to an offended judge from whose face you turn away but as to a tender father who invites you to come unto him and he will give you rest happiness greater than any you have ever known happiness repeated gertrude no my heart is for ever closed against that ah do not say so said anne god can put an heavenly calm into that heart which is shut against all earthly joys gertrude felt the truth of these simple words and by degrees her soul emerged from the dreary stupor in which it had so long been buried and her mind became soothed and composed beneath the calming influence of that religion whose very essence is love and peace she saw that her heart had gone astray in its own delusions but these were dispelled she had received a new impulse and she had awakened if not to happiness at least to something less perishable less fatal hers had been a young fancy which could convert the sound of common things to something exquisite but now she bowed her heart in quietness she knew her brightest prospects could revive no more yet was she calm for she had heaven in view o oh, thou who driest the mourner's tear how dark this world would be if when deceived and wounded here we could not fly to thee 
the friends who in our sunshine live when winter comes are flown and he who has but tears to give must weep those tears alone but thou wilt heal the broken heart which like the plants that throw their fragrance from the wounded part breathes sweetness out of woe more end of section one hundred and four section one hundred and five of the inheritance by susan edmonstone ferrier this librivox recording is in the public domain volume three chapter thirty four forgiveness to the injured does belong but they ne'er pardon who commit the wrong dryden it was with emotion that gertrude and lindsay met once more and both were struck with the change in each other's appearance for lindsay too looked as though he had indeed borne a part in all her sufferings and she was smote with the selfishness which had caused her so long to indulge her sorrow unmindful of the generous heart which had shared in it but if the brilliancy of her beauty was dimmed by the blight which had fallen upon her it had acquired a character of still deeper interest in the eyes of those who loved her her pale cheek like a white rose on which the sun hath looked too wildly warm is not this passion's legend the drooping lid whose lash is wet with tears a lip which has the sweetness of a smile but not its gaiety do not these bear the scorched footprints sorrow leaves in passing or the clear brow of youth i would first see you to acknowledge the boundless gratitude i owe for all your kindness to me said gertrude who was the first to speak and then once you ask me to forgive her who had injured me and i would not for then i was proud passionate revengeful but now i would go to her i would forgive her even as i trust i have been forgiven dearest gertrude said lindsay with emotion how happy this makes me but do not humble me by talking of your gratitude to me to have done less than i have done when the means were in my power would have been criminal if i have been enabled to serve you that is recompense more than sufficient i have borne a selfish part in your welfare for your happiness was mine in vain my heart has tried to create a separate interest it cannot do not talk thus my dear friend said gertrude in agitation ah gertrude since the same true and immortal passion has touched our hearts suffer me now to avow the sentiments which i have so long cherished for you no no not now cried gertrude in increasing emotion be to me all that you have hitherto been a friend a guardian a brother but she sighed and in spite of herself a tear rolled slowly down her cheek i will then said lindsay for he feared that the ties which bound them might be broken in the effort to draw them closer gertrude went to the house of the miss blacks and was received by them with tears of tenderness and thankfulness mrs st clair had recovered from the effects of the laudanum she had swallowed and it was now her determination to go abroad for the remainder of her life and in a few days she was to depart she talked much of you for some time said miss black and said she could not die in peace till she had obtained your forgiveness but of late alas since her health has been restored she has thought i fear less seriously and she has not spoken of you at all perhaps she may even be averse to see you and she went to acquaint her that gertrude was there some time elapsed before she returned and she said her sister had been violently agitated at the thoughts of seeing gertrude and had at first refused to do it but that she was now more composed and had consented to receive her upon condition that she came alone the room was darkened to which gertrude was conducted but there was a studied arrangement 
an air of elegant seclusion about it which at once indicated that the inmate was unchanged no symptom of penitence was there she was attired in an elegant deshabille and her fantouille her cushions her footstool her screen her flowers her perfumes her toys were all collected around her in the manner gertrude had been so long accustomed to see them and on the arrangement of which mrs st clair had been wont to pique herself as a combination of french elegance and english comfort for a moment gertrude felt a rising of disgust at this display of heartless selfishness but she repressed it and extending her hand said mildly i am come to offer that forgiveness which i once refused but god has put better feelings in my heart and i now forgive you from the heart as i hope to be forgiven i too have something to forgive said mrs st clair vehemently i have to forgive the cruel disregard the unnatural unrelenting violence with which you treated one who had ever been as a mother to you in all but the natural tie i had done all for your aggrandizement i had raised you from beggary and obscurity to wealth and greatness and it is you who have brought me to shame and misery and poverty and am i to have nothing to forgive i humbled myself in the dust to you and you was deaf to my prayers i told you that my life was in your hands that it did not pay the forfeit of your rash and inhuman conduct is no merit of yours have i then nothing to forgive but i do forgive said she extending the hand she had hitherto refused but with an air and manner of haughty condescension my wrongs and injuries have been great but i forgive them gertrude almost recoiled with horror from the touch of one whose mind was still so perverted and whose soul seemed to have been corroded instead of purified by the judgment that had fallen upon her but she meekly took her hand and said you say true mere human forgiveness is indeed a thing of naught more blessed to them who give than to them who receive but i pray o god do thou hear my prayer that thy forgiveness may be vouchsafed she turned and left the apartment she did not wound her sisters by repeating what had passed but her own heart felt lighter that she had been enabled to pray in sincerity of heart for heavenly forgiveness even to her who had wrought all her woe end of section one hundred and five section one hundred and six of the inheritance by susan edmonstone ferrier this librivox recording is in the public domain volume three chapter thirty five good the beginning good the end shall be and transitory evil only makes the good end happier salvi the following day a plain but handsome carriage with suitable attendants stood at uncle adam's door which he at first seemed ashamed of but after a little coyness and confusion he let gertrude understand it was for her accommodation and proposed that they should together make trial of it gertrude had never appeared abroad except in her visit to mrs st clair from the time of her arrival at mr ramsay's and a thousand painful feelings rushed upon her at the thoughts of exposing herself to the public gaze and the public gaze of a small idle gossiping impertinent country town she was therefore on the point of expressing her repugnance but she thought it would be unkind ungrateful when he had sacrificed his feelings so far as to set up a carriage for her if she did not appear to be gratified by this proof of his affection she therefore accepted of his proposal and away they drove she was not yet sufficiently mistress of her thoughts to bestow much observation on the shifting scenes as they passed along and she was scarcely aware of where she was or on what she looked when she found herself at the very door of bloom park they entered and a respectable-looking housekeeper and butler with inferiors stood ready to receive them there's your leddy said uncle adam giving gertrude a slight push by way of introducing her see that you a uh, behave discreetly and when ye want ony thing ye maun gang to her fort 
for she kens mair aboot they things than me this was quite an oration for uncle adam and having made it he stodded in to one of the public rooms and gertrude followed him my dear uncle said she for she still continued that appellation how your kindness overpowers me i cannot express how much i feel it hoot it's naething said he impatiently so dinna gang to fash yourself aboot that the best thanks you can give me is to let me see the red on your cheek and the smell in your e that used to be there and then i'll believe that i've done you some good but no till then and he affectionately patted her shoulder which was going great lengths for uncle adam everything had evidently been done with a view to gratify gertrude's taste and feelings and there was a good taste and elegance in the arrangements that had recently been made for which with all his good intentions she could scarcely give uncle adam credit it must be lindsay's doing lindsay who knew so well all her habits and pursuits had provided every indulgence and facility for both and that too merely in a general way without descending to all the little minutiae which it is woman's prerogative to arrange the news of mr ramsay's establishment at bloom park soon circulated in the neighbourhood and was not long of reaching the ears of mrs major waddell and caused them to tingle with indignation and envy in the midst of all her finery she was not happy for gertrude as uncle adam's heiress was the thorn in her side the bitter drop in her cup the black man in her closet the mordecai at her gate such is ever the effect of any baleful passion especially when operating on a weak mind and so difficult is it to form an estimate of worldly enjoyment by the symbols of outward prosperity her only hope was that she would be able to prove uncle adam in his dotage and for that purpose she would fain have established a system of espionage betwixt thornbank and bloom park but all her schemes were counteracted by uncle adam's sagacity the only way in which she could therefore give vent to her malice was when in company with gertrude by taking or rather making every opportunity of resting all claim to distinction solely on the ground of birth family connections and other such adventitious circumstances as the weak vulgar mind lays hold of to exalt itself in the eyes of those who must be weaker than itself to be so dazzled but in this she was met by uncle adam who guarded gertrude in aught that in any way concerned her as a faithful shepherd's colleague does the lamb committed to his charge and he was now too happy to be discomposed even by mrs waddell he had found something to love which had long been the desideratum in his life and he was gradually getting more benign and mellow beneath gertrude's gentle influence the first inconveniences of a change of residence and habits fairly over he even began to take some interest in rural avocations only stipulating that he was never to be spoken to on any of the numerous evils inseparable from extensive property and which not unfrequently embitter the peace of the possessor such as bad tenants bad crops bad weather bad servants poachers robbers trespassers and all the thousand ills that wealth is heir to and which perhaps bring happiness more upon a par between the rich and the poor than is generally supposed one of the first to pay her respects to the new heiress of bloom park was miss pratt that lady's absence or at least her silence for so long a period remains to be accounted for to such as take an interest in her fate but the simple matter of fact was that she had been refreshing and invigorating herself at harrogate at the expense of her friend and ally sir peter wellwood and had but just returned to give the lie direct to the current report of gertrude's having been rejected by her lover on the discovery of her birth this she roundly asserted was so far from being the case that she had with her own ears heard her refuse him again and again it was consistent with her knowledge that she had been long engaged to edward lindsay and although the little episode of the turret scene was somewhat of a staggerer yet even that miss pratt contrived to bolt and settle the matter with herself by her having had a great cold and ringing in her ears all that day which had prevented her hearing exactly what passed she therefore boldly claimed her five guineas from uncle adam though how far she was entitled to them was a doubtful question and might have borne a dispute and time was when uncle adam would as soon have given her his five fingers as his five guineas upon such debatable ground but now he was not disposed to cavil at trifles and he paid her the money at the first suggestion only taking every possible precaution against the possibility of his giving her a note more than enough 
well my dear said she displaying her winnings to gertrude you see i can sing a blithe note at your wedding ha 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 and by the by do you know the news is that a certain cast-off lover of yours is on the top of his marriage with his old flame the duchess of st ives they're both together at paris it seems and it's all settled i wish them good of one another for i fancy they're well met but whether they'll hang long together is another story gertrude could not hear of this event without some degree of emotion but it soon passed away and when at the end of some months she read a pompous detail of it in the newspapers it was with feelings far removed from either envy or regret still less would they have been called for could she have foreseen the termination which a few years brought round without the cement of one virtuous principle vice soon dissolved the tie which united them injured and betrayed by a faithless wife the earl of rossville fought to avenge his honour and fell in the cause but long before then lindsay's virtues and the fervour and disinterestedness of his attachment had insensibly created for him a warm interest in gertrude's affections as has been truly said in considering the actions of the mind it should never be forgotten that its affections pass into each other like the tints of the rainbow though we can easily distinguish them when they have assumed a decided colour yet we can never determine where each hue begins the bewildering glare of romantic passion no longer shed its fair but perishable lustre on the horizon of her existence but the calm radiance of piety and virtue rose with steady ray and brightened the future course of a happy and a useful life and gertrude as the wife of edward lindsay lived to bless the day that had deprived her of her earthly inheritance to that indeed by the death of lord rossville who dying without a family was succeeded by lindsay she was again restored with a mind enlightened as to the true uses and advantages of power and prosperity thus all our ill may if directed well find happy end the end end of section one hundred and six end of the inheritance by susan edmonstone ferrier